Hey, what's up, everybody? How we doing, church? Man, it is so good, so good to see you. Thank you for being here today. I want to take a minute. I want to welcome everybody who is watching via the interwebs right now. And, of course, everybody over at the South Side, South Campus, everybody at the North Campus, we love you. And maybe you're watching this uh, on a treadmill after the fact. Maybe you're working out. Maybe you're running. You're working on your fitness. However you're engaging with this. We love you, and the best way that we can show you that is by clapping for you. So come on, everybody everywhere, put your hands together. We love you. Yeah, I like that. Vocal. I like that. Um, well, uh, we are in a new series called Reset, something we do really every year. We talk about spiritual disciplines. We kind of reset our heart, and uh, it gives us the opportunity just to approach the year uh, completely different and with, with the reset. And we knew uh, several months ago that that's exactly what all of us would need. Ending 2020, uh, which all of us would be really happy about because it was the year we hoped to forget. Uh, but what we, what we wanted to have is a, a reset of our hearts because that's what you need. Like sometimes you need a hard reset. Now, uh, you know, with electronics, a lot of times, like they'll get buggy. You know, you ever have your phone get buggy, your computer get buggy, and and uh, you'll be like, okay, something's wrong. I need to take it back. I need to return it. And then someone will tell you, oh, no, all you need to do is just turn it off and then turn it back on. And then you're like, no, there's no way that that's going to do anything. And then you're like, no, all you need to do is turn it back on, turn it off, turn it back on. And, and, and you're like, no, this, this thing is broken. This thing needs a healing from Jesus. This thing, I need to take it back to Best Buy. And you're like, no, just turn it off and then turn it back on. You're like, oh, fine, I'll show you. I guess you're right. Have you ever had that moment <laughs> where you're like, oh, you know what? Actually, turning it off and turning it back on work. Come here. Have you ever been there? Just raise your hand if you've ever been there. Okay, both campuses. If you're watching online, give me a thumbs up. Uh, you've ever been in that moment. But sometimes, sometimes they'll tell you to turn it off and then turn it back on. You'll do it. And it won't work because you need to have a hard reset. Like you need to go into the factory settings. You, you need to go back to how this thing works was originally programmed. And that's what we're doing this year with the Reset Series. We're going back to how God really intended. We're resetting our hearts because the calendar change that happened between 2020 and 2021 didn't fix everything, right? <laughs> like, how many know 2021 looks a lot like 2020 so far? And, and it will for us unless we change our hearts. But the good news is you and I can actually have control over how we experience the things around us by what we allow to happen in our hearts. And so we are in the middle of a reset campaign. And the big idea for this campaign is reset happens when we center our hearts on Christ. That's the reset. And so we're in the spiritual uh, re campaign called uh, Reset. We're fasting, we're praying, we're reading, and we're attending. And so if you're just joining us, if, like, if you're brand new and you're like, what are you talking about? I want to encourage you to jump in with us because we're going on a journey. We're going on a journey saying, God, if you really are everything and really what I need is a heart reset from the inside out and you can provide that for me, then I want all that you have for me. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read and I'm going to attend. And so uh, if you want more information, you go to our website. You can download our app and check that out. Wait, we have an app? Yes, we have an app, everybody. And it's dope. It's straight up dope. So check it out. It's awesome. There's, there's, there's great content. There's uh, great devotionals there, and you will grow. I promise, if you do those four things, if you join us on this journey where you're doing these four things, you're fasting, you're praying, you're reading, you're attending, God is going to shape your life so no. No matter what 2021 might bring, you're going to approach it in the best way possible. And if you believe it, say, I do. All right. And, and basically for this series, what we did is we, we looked at King David. We started looking at King David. And if you missed any of the messages, I want to encourage you to go online, check them out. Or you can go on our app and check them out. Listen back to them. Because we looked at David because what's interesting about King David is that he is picked by God to be the leader of Israel. Not the first leader, but the second leader. Because the second leader got squirrely and he did his own thing and he turned away from God. So God picks David because David has a heart after God. So he's showing us what it's like to actually have a heart after God. And, and we looked at, at how because he did have a heart after God, 
he was able to do what God asked him to do, and he experienced great favor and success. And because he had a heart after God, he was able to apologize when he didn't do what God asked him to do. And we looked at how all of it was based on because he spent time with God. He had this relationship with God. So a couple, couple weeks ago, I was like, all right, let's go in. Let's go develop a relationship with God. And maybe some of you are like, all right, I don't, I don't know exactly what that looks like. And so last week we talked about how to study the Bible, the power of the Bible, the power of reading God's word in our heart and how understanding it helps us know our purpose and, and it helps us not be carried off by the current of the world. But here's what I want to talk about today. God doesn't want to just talk to you or at you. He wants to have a relationship with you. So he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak truth and grace and purpose to your heart, but then he wants you to speak back to him. He wants this to be a back and forth type of thing. Have you ever been in a conversation where someone is doing all of the talking and you can't ever get a word in? Have you ever been in that moment where you're like, they just came in, oh, no, because I mean, they went over there. And it's just one girl, she said this, and you're like, I wouldn't, and you just keep trying to get the word in and you can't. It's annoying, right? Like, it's kind of like, oh, my goodness, if I could just say something, that would be great. God doesn't want that with us. He wants a relationship with us. And prayer and reading the Bible, they go together incredibly well. In fact, one without the other just really isn't, isn't all that it could be. You really, need, you really need them. They're just better together. It's like, it's like having cereal without milk. I mean, that's just, that's just gross. I mean, it's like... It's like having fries, French fries, without salt. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want that. It's like, it's like Tuesdays without tacos. I mean, you, you wouldn't, it's like coffee cake without coffee. I mean, you just, what's the point? It's like the AFC championship without Mahomes. Let's pray right now. Jesus, touch him. Amen. Some of you are like, I got behind that prayer. That's a prayer I can get behind. Uh, Some things just work better together, all right? This is a Bible, reading, and prayer. And so God speaks to us, and then prayer is us verbalizing our heart back to him. And he wants all of it. He wants the good stuff. He wants the bad stuff. He wants us talking about what we're struggling with, what we're feeling, what we're going through. He wants a relationship with you. That is amazing. When you think about the God who spoke the world into existence, literally all that we know is natural, that God wants a relationship with you. Not just the people on the platform, not just the spiritual people, not just the church people. God wants a relationship with you where he speaks to your heart. And you speak back to him. And man, there is nothing more powerful on this planet than that. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to develop a prayer life. How to develop an active prayer life that, that results in a difference uh, in our hearts towards God. And, and I want to look for just a few moments. I want to look at King David because that's what we've been looking at. King David had a vibrant prayer life. He was praying all the time. In fact, the book of Psalms in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms is, is prayers. Most of them are David's prayers that he's praying to God. And I love how real and raw David is in the Psalms. I mean, he is so honest and so vulnerable and so open. Um, he, he prays as a shepherd. He pray, one of the, the psalm, Psalms that he prays is Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So he's talking to God. He's expressing his love for God. He talks, so he talked to God while he was a boy as a shepherd. He talks to God while he was on the run from Saul. King Saul gets crazy wants to kill David. So he's after David. And David prays, God, deliver me from my enemies. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. So you see this desperation. Psalm 23 is worship and adoration. Then you see this desperation. Then in Psalm 3, now he's on the run from his, psalm, uh, from his son, Absalom. He says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying to me, God will not deliver him, but you 
O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. So he's on the run, and he's praying. He's, he's in, the, he's in the, the valley with the sheep, and he's praying. And he gets real, too. This is what I love about Psalms. You read him, and you're like, man, he has some real vulnerable moments. Sometimes he's like, oh, God, deliver me. And then sometimes he's like, oh, God, just kill all of them. <laughs> Literally, you can see in Psalm 140, do not grant the wicked their desires, Lord. Do not let their plans succeed. Those who surround me proudly rear their heads. May the mischief of their lips engulf them, and may burning coals fall on them. May they be thrown into the fire, into miry pits, never to rise. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt, you ever felt like praying a prayer like that? Like this week, maybe you just felt like praying some prayers like that. I don't know necessarily that's a prescription for prayer, but I love how honest David is in this prayer. Then you see how he prays when he messes up with Bathsheba, and we looked at this in week one. But Psalm 51 says, have mercy on me, O God. So he, he does the unthinkable. He sleeps with his good friend's wife. She becomes pregnant. Then he kills his good friend. He gets confronted on. He's like, I can't believe I've done this. And he says, have mercy. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You look all throughout the Psalms and you see there's these great, honest, vulnerable moments that David is having with God. And you see that it's a relationship. God wants a relationship with you, where he speaks to you and you speak back to him. This is David. He's constantly doing this. He's reading. He's meditating. He's thinking about the word. Then he's talking back to God, and it's all rec recorded through the Psalms. And when this happens, he develops a heart after God. This is how our hearts grow towards, Lord, towards the Lord. Our hearts change in prayer. Our hearts grow in prayer. And our hearts are focused in prayer. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Our heart changes in prayer. Our heart grows in prayer. And our heart focuses in prayer. Things change when we pray. Turn to the person next to you and say, things change when you pray. Things change when you pray. It's true. Things change when you pray. And you know who shows us the power of this, maybe more than anybody else, is Jesus. When Jesus shows up on the scene, his ministry is marked by change. Everywhere he's going, he's changing. He's bringing power. He's bringing strength. He's bringing a difference. And he brings online this new power. It was kind of seen in the Old Testament, but now it's like every day there's a powerful moment. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And where is it rooted? In prayer. You can see this at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right? What does he do? He retreats back to the wilderness. He goes and he fasts and he prays. Regularly throughout his ministry, he would withdraw to lonely places and pray. When he heals people, he prays. When he's about to leave his disciples, he prays. When he's weighing the decision about his death in the Garden of Gethsemane, what's he doing? He prays, and as he is dying on the cross, he prays. Everything that Jesus did was rooted in prayer. He's constantly praying. He's constantly talking to God. There is power in prayer because prayer is where you find God. And I want to encourage us. This is where we're going to experience a different year. 2021 will be different when we pray. There's all kinds of advantages to praying. If you're single and you want to be married, any single people want to be married in this place? Okay. You should pray. If you're married and you want to be single, you should pray. If you want to have kids, you should pray. If you have kids, you're praying all the time. You're praying, and then you're crying, and then you're praying, and then you're crying, praying all kind of just weaves together. If you're frustrated, you should pray. If you're discouraged, you should pray. If you're happy, 
you should pray. If you're disappointed, you should pray. If you're distracted, you should pray. If you're tempted, you should pray. There is power in prayer because prayer is where we find God. James chapter 5 says this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's power. There's power in prayer. When we go to God, it's more than just us lifting words to the ceiling. It's literally us communicating with the maker of heaven and earth. And he longs to hear us when we pray. And there's power that gets unleashed when we pray. Now, it's, it's, a, lot like, it's a lot like a power outlet. So, for instance, there's, there's tons of power that is happening right now in this room. Some of this power is being tapped into. It's, it's getting the lights going. It's, it's getting the sound going. It's getting the cameras going, the projectors going. There's some of this power that's being tapped into, but there's more power available that's not being tapped into. And so, like, let's say, for example, like you, you, you came in here, you're like, man, I'd really like to just put a hole in this wall. Like, you know, I just really like to just put just, just a hole right there. I would ask that you not do that, but like if you really just wanted to do that, there'd be a number of ways you could do that. You could do that, you know, with with an axe, or you could do that with a laser, and I think a laser would be more fun. And so we're trying to find a laser that, that we could do that. We have a little video here. I want to show you this. This is a laser right out of Star Wars. This is, like, this is a real laser that this guy made, and he turns it on, and look at that thing. It's like it's literally going to cut through a Samsung phone and because uh, they're not worth much anyway. So you just kind of like just goes right through it. It goes right through it. Isn't that cool? That's worthy of a clap, I think. I don't know. It's, why not? So here's the deal. Here's the deal. So you could, you could bring that laser here. And you'd be like, I'm going to put a hole right in that wall. And you could just get that laser set up and ready to go. And, ready, and it's just, here we go. And we're going to cut the hole. And here it is. Nothing will happen unless you plug that laser in. That laser has great potential. That laser has power. It is literally made to do powerful things, but it will experience none of it unless it's plugged in to the source. Prayer is where we literally plug our spirits into the source. It's literally where we connect back to God, and God designs it this way to keep us close to him. When we pray, it's like plugging back in. And there's all kinds of wisdom, there's all kinds of grace, there's all kinds of hope, there's all kinds of help that comes online when we pray. Powerful things happen when we pray because prayer is where God is. And the disciples watch Jesus' ministry. And they watch him over and over and over again. He's doing stuff, and then he's pulling away to pray. He's healing people, then he's pulling away to pray. He's making a difference in people's lives, then he pulls away to pray. His whole ministry was based in prayer. And so there's a moment where they say, Jesus, we see this. We see you're doing all these things. You're healing blind people. You're, you're, you're feeding the 5,000. Like you're... you're, you're you're literally, you're raising people from the dead, and it's all connected to your prayer life. So they say, teach us to pray. Luke chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there. Luke chapter 11, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, hey, will you teach us to pray? And this is, this is a powerful passage in Scripture. I want to spend a little bit of time here. We can go from here, uh, Luke chapter 11. We're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 6 as well. But we'll start in Luke chapter 11. And this is where the disciples say, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as Don, John taught his disciples. Then Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer, which we'll come back to here in just a minute. So he gives them a structure for prayer. But at the end of that section, he gives them some mindsets of prayer. So he gives them how to pray, and, and he says, now here's the way that I want you to pray. And there's three things that I want to give you uh, about how to approach God, and they're this. Pray boldly, pray consistently, and pray confidently. When God wants you to come to him, he wants you to pray boldly, pray consistently, and then pray confidently. Now, I want, to, I want to look at these three mindsets. Then we're going to look at the basis from where all of these mindsets come from. And then I'm going to give you the structure on how to pray. Now, this can be very practical. 
It's going to be very practical. Both last week and this week, we're talking about lots of practicality because I want to do more than just inspire you. I do want to inspire you, but I want to help you live this thing out. It is, it is why we exist. It's why this church is here. It is to help you live this thing out. And um, there are a couple of things that Jesus gives us that will really help us do that. And so I want to help us to learn how to pray. Before we do, you got to look to your neighbor. You've got you to talk to your neighbor. Turn to three people and say, MC Hammer was right. you got to pray just to make it today. Come on, tell three people, MC Hammer was right. It's hammer time. How many of you, just honestly, just how many of you have no idea who MC Hammer is? Just raise your hand. You have no idea. Okay, that's cool. It's great. It's great. Makes me feel so old. All right, let me give you, let me give you, the, uh, let me give you these three things, these three spirits, all right? Number one, pray boldly. Luke chapter 11 in verse 5. Jesus gives them an illustration. He gives us like kind of three different illustrations on how we should pray. The first one is to pray boldly. He says, he gives them a picture. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, let me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food. And suppose the one inside answered him, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. Everybody say audacity. audacity. Come on, everybody with strength. Say audacity. audacity. Because of audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This is a very interesting story. Now, you may just read through that. You might just breeze through that. Let me break this down for you, okay? This is literally in the middle of the night. Some dude is coming and saying, hey, can I have some food? Now, I'm a sleep person. I like me some sleep. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just raise or you give me a thumbs up on the comments, okay? I like me some sleep. I don't like my sleep interrupted. I'm not a good person. I'm not a good person. I'm not saved. I'm not, I'm, I just, Christianity leaves me while I sleep. And it comes back when I wake up. Do not wake me when I'm sleeping. It was not going to be a pretty picture. I do not like being woken up in the middle of the night. And so here's this neighbor. This guy comes to his friend in the middle of the night. This isn't an emergency. His friend isn't dying. He just needs a late night snack. <laughs> now, I like me a late night snack, too. I mean, <laughs> so I get it, especially early on in quarantine does anybody remember like i just felt like the days just kind of all meshed together and i was like rocking nachos with coca-cola chasers at 11 30. it was it was getting crazy there were a few nights like at like 10 50 i was like andy's closes in 10 minutes i can make it i can make it there were a few nights it got it got crazy all right so i like late night snacks but you don't wake your neighbor up for a late night snack, right? How many of you would be ticked if that happened to you? Just raise your hand if you, wouldn't you be ticked if like someone came on? <laughs> Who is it? Oh, it's your neighbor. <laughs> I'm sleeping. I need something. You go down and open the door. You know, it's like, dude, oh my gosh, what are you doing, man? What, what, it's 1230, it's one o'clock, two in the morning. What do you need, like, what do you need, man? Dude, you got any Fritos? <laughs> I don't have any Fritos, but say hello to my little friend. <laughs> There's a little Detroit coming out, maybe. I don't know. That's how I would respond. And especially true. <laughs> We're getting crazy. I know, it's a little crazy. Especially true in that day. Especially true in that day. Because most of the houses were one room. One room with one bed for the whole fam. So if parents know how, how, much, how treacherous someone interrupting sleep for kids can be, right? This is like, do not do that. Do not do that. So if you ever, like, kids been sleeping, it's like, you try to be as quiet as you can. And you got, I need some bread. So you start, like, Whisper shouting, hey, I've got kids, <laughs> and they're sleeping. Get out of here. Boom, boom, boom. I need some bread. And you would think, like, this would be like, Jesus would be like, this is not the way you approach God. 
This is not the way you get something from God. But watch what Jesus says in verse 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up uh, and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. There's something about just the, the fact that I can't believe you're doing this. But here you go and never come back, you know. But Jesus is saying that's how you should approach God. It's kind, of, it's kind of crazy. There's this shameless audacity. Here's what I want to encourage you uh, uh, with that Jesus is teaching us. He says, I want you to come with big, bold, audacious prayers. Prayers that you wouldn't want to because you'd be like, no, I can't bother him. No, Jesus is like, no, you go ahead and bother him. He wants to hear from you. So you pray with boldness. Do you approach your prayer time with boldness? You're coming boldly into the throne of grace like Hebrews tells us to do. I'm coming boldly. I'm coming, I'm coming with some confidence. I'm coming with some courage. Because I, I know that God is able. And I know that God is willing. Boom, 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 boom. It's the middle of the night. God wants to hear from you. And you can bring any request, big or small, to God, shamelessly and audaciously. You bring whatever you got. The, the world might say it's impossible. The doctor might say it's impossible. Your bank account might say it's impossible. But God is the God of impossible. He, 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 he overcomes impossibilities. Nothing is too difficult for him. So you pray, you pray uh, with boldness. And then the second thing, you pray consistently. Pray boldly and then pray consistently. This is verse 9. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now what's happening here is there's a progression that's building. So Jesus is like, hey, why don't you ask God? So bring your request, but then once you ask God, then you can seek God, and then once you seek God, you knock. So there's like this, it getting more involved at each progression. What Jesus is saying, what literally the, the, the translation of this is, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, and knock and keep knocking. So you just keep, you just keep bringing that request to God. It's, he's laying out this, this mindset of actively and continually bringing every request that you have over and over and over to, to God and saying, God, I will not be denied. So there's the boldness, but then there's the persistence. There's the consistency that Jesus is looking for. It's, a, it's like praying for something over and over and over again until you see a breakthrough. You know, when we planted the church, all of it was based on this book, uh, called The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. We share this story at a welcome party. Uh, but, but my pastor had us read this book, and it's a great book, and I would encourage you to check it out if you've never checked it out before. It's a really great book. But the whole idea for the book is that you pray for something over and over and over and over again until you get a breakthrough. And, and God will put something on your heart, and you just keep circling it. You just keep going around and around and around. And that's what happened for, with us you know, planting this church. We just kept praying over it. Every morning, I just, I remember getting up, and I didn't know what God had, was going to do, but I, I just felt like change was coming. And so I just kept praying over and over, and I literally circled my neighborhood. I said, God, whatever you want to do, I'm just going to trust you. God, bring the change. Bring the change. Whatever you want, bring the change. And when God, I mean, really revealed it to me that we are going to be planning a church, it was unbelievable the favor and grace that followed us stepping out in faith. And I can tell you this, what God has done is so much bigger than certainly me, certainly bigger than our team. This, is, this was, isn't our dream. It wasn't even our ambition. But I believe that it was based and rooted in praying and saying, God, whatever you want to do, I'm praying, I'm seeking you. And it was, it was locking in and tapping into the power source. And God's gone before us. And we've done this with every move we, we've made. So, like, when we bought our house, we prayed over our house. We prayed over our house. We kept praying over our houses. God, lead us to the right house. We prayed over this facility. 
God opened up a, a facility. We prayed over South Campus. Every move we've made as a church, we've prayed, we've prayed, we've prayed, we've engaged prayer, and God has gone before us. This is the power of consistent prayer. So you want to pray boldly, you want to pray consistently, and then Jesus says you want to pray confidently. Look what he says in verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Now, it's interesting because my son's never asked me for a fish. But if he did, I certainly wouldn't give him a snake. So he's keying in on something. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. That's just weird. It's like if he asks for food, you're going to give him a scorpion? Who's messed up like that? He says, if you then, though you're evil, he says, like, you're not perfect, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's saying, you can pray with confidence because God is good and he knows what you need and he wants to take care of you. You can pray trusting God, knowing that he knows what he's doing and that he's created you for a purpose and he wants you to experience that and he's not gonna keep it from you, but he wants to give it to you. He says, so you can pray with boldness and ask for anything. Then there's a persistence that keeps asking for that anything. And then there's the confidence that says, okay, God, at the end of the day, I'm trusting you with anything and everything that comes my way because you are good and you do good. Do you see that? Bold, persistent and confident. So those are, the big, those are the big three spirits behind prayer, but Jesus shows us more than just the spirit behind prayer. He actually shows us the basis for, for all of the prayer that we would have, and it's, it's in the Lord's Prayer, the first line of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to go to Matthew's version it's because it's a little bit more familiar. So Luke's version is a little bit different, word different. Matthew's version is more familiar for how we traditionally know the Lord's Prayer. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. And this is the secret to prayer. Pray to God as Father. If you're taking notes, write that down. If you hear nothing else, please hear that. Pray to God as Father. Now that sounds real normal to you and me, right? Because you've heard that like about a million times. You've been around church. Even if you haven't been around church, you've probably heard someone say, you know, Heavenly Father, God Father. But in Jesus' day, you didn't call God Father. This is one of the things that Jesus completely revolutionized. You called God Creator. You called God Lord. You called him Yahweh or Jehovah or Maker of heaven and earth. But you didn't call him Father. But every time that Jesus prays, he says, Father. And then he tells his disciples, this is what I want you to do. And let me just tell you, this is where bold, consistent, and confident prayers are rooted in looking to God as Father. Looking to God as Father. And in fact, Jesus will expound on this idea when he's on the cross in Mark chapter 14. And he'll say, Abba, Father. He cries out, Abba, Father. Now, we don't have an exact translation for the word Abba, but do you know the closest thing we have is the word Daddy? That's the closest thing we've got. Jesus says, I, I look to God as my Daddy. Now, there's nothing like having your kids call you Daddy. All the fathers will know that that's true. My daughter's still young enough where she, she, calls, me, she calls me Daddy, and and it's so cute because, you know, she's still learning words. She's three, so she's just learning words and sentences. So she, she does the, Daddy hold you. Daddy hold you. You know, for us to pick her up, she's like, oh, yeah, come on. I'll hold you. This is the best. Whenever she says that, it's the best. And um, she started doing this, other, this thing recently where she'll, she'll start saying, hey, Scott. <laughs> No, no, no. She thinks it's funny, too, because I always correct her. Yeah, Scott. Hey, Scott. No, 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 no. You don't call me Scott. Everybody else calls me Scott. You call me Daddy. And it's different, right? It's different. Because the, the name Daddy, it, it implies this closeness, 
this affection, this intimacy, this innocence, this trust. And I want to ask you, is that how you view God? Do you view God as daddy? Like where you could just go in and, and not care and not feel like you're interrupting and feel like he wants to hear from you and feel like he wants to see you and wants to pick you up. Jesus is saying, you need to view God like that. And see, when that's the root of our prayer, when that's the root of our faith, then we can come boldly. We can come consistently. We can come confidently. Do you see that? Because we know that God, he actually, he's, he's actually happy to see us when we pray. When you wake up in the morning, you get ready for your prayer time, this isn't an obligation. This is an opportunity to go talk with dad. And he wants to see you. And he wants to help you. And he wants to heal your heart. And he wants to reset you from the inside out. Jesus is changing the game on how we talk to God. And then he gives us the structure. And this is the Lord's Prayer. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, if you've been in church for a while, this seems rote, this seems religious, but I want to challenge you to think about this as revolutionary. This is revolutionary. It's going to God in a different way, in a personal way, in an intimate way. And there's a structure here that will actually help you connect with God. I'm all about practicality. For me, faith, I love faith, I love the, the worship, I love the emotion, but I like the practice. And so I'm going to give you a breakdown of this passage. Some of you have heard this before. Most of you probably haven't heard this, but, but it's, a, it's a heart for God, P-R-A-Y-S, praise. A heart for God, praise. And that's literally the breakdown of this. And this, I'm simple. This helps me pray. And I want to give you the prayer pattern that comes from the Lord's Prayer. Because I think Jesus is actually giving us a pattern of prayer that he wants us to use to connect with God. All right, so the first one is P, which stands for praise. Second is R, repent. A is ask. Y is your will. And then S is show me. Because we live in Missouri. <laughs> that was appropriate. Okay. First one is P, praise. This is hallowed be your name. Now, this, this doesn't have, no, hold on a second. Let me tell you this. If you do this, if you pray this way every morning, P-R-A-Y-S, you will connect with God every day. Simple. But let me just show you how this breaks down. P is praise. Hallowed be your name. We don't have a good English word for hallowed. You don't, we don't talk about that very often. Hallowed. And a lot of translations will translate that holy, and it does mean holy, but it's actually more than that. It actually means ultimate. It's, it's like preeminent. It's altogether separate and unique and dominant. That's what hallowed means. And so when you, when you start your prayer, you're starting with a praise that is, God, you are everything. God, you're majestic, you're holy, you're wonderful, you're the creator. When you start your prayer time like that, all of a sudden, your heart just begins to widen, begins to enlarge, begins to see God for who he is. God, I praise you for, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are my creator, you're my maker, you're my savior, you're my God, you're my king. God, you are wonderful, and I worship you. What well, if you start your prayer time like that every day? You know what happened? Your heart would, would just widen towards the things of God. And then there's also, I think I would encourage you to put a thanksgiving component in, that, in, in along with that praise. So just start thanking God. See, a lot of times we start our prayers with like, God, I need this and I need that and this person stinks and I can't stand this person and the kids are terrible, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you just start going through those things. 
But you start, but God, you're amazing. You're awesome. You're wonderful. And God, I thank you for every good thing in my life. I'm going to go through all the different things, the blessings, my family, my wife, my kids, my house, my city, my church, my, my state, my country. God, I have so much to be thankful for. All of a sudden, you put yourself in a mindset that is focused on God as your everything. So then you praise, and then you repent. So P-R, you repent. So you say, God, I'm sorry. Because how many know we always have things that we're sorry for? We, we should. Because, man, we're not perfect. If anybody thinks we are perfect, you're, you're really far from perfect then. You, don't, you just don't know how messed up you are. We're all just messed up. We're all broken people. And see, when you say, God, you know what? You start thinking back on your day yesterday. God, is there anything that I missed it on? Is there anything I'm, I'm missing it on right now? And you repent. And here's what that does. Here's what daily repentance does. It keeps us from getting too far off track. God, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for thinking I've got all of this figured out. Forgive, forgive me for putting my trust in man. Forgive, forgive me for putting my trust in my money. Oh, God, keep my heart soft before you. Keep my heart soft in relationship with you. I'm going to repent. And then what that allows us to do is forgive others who've wronged us. And that's what Jesus says, right? Because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner and, and sinners have offended me, so I'm not going to hold grudges. You know what that does? It keeps us free from bitterness. See how Jesus, I mean, this is a powerful prayer that Jesus is doing. P-R-A. Then you ask, give us this day our daily bread. I encourage you to have a prayer list. You bring to God and say, God, I'm praying for these things every day. I'm believing, and I can't wait to check them off and put them into the praise report column. Right now, they're in the prayer request, and I can't wait to put them in the praise report. And then you ask. But here's the cool thing about what he says, give us this day our daily bread. You know what he's saying? There's a community part of that. So it's not just about you. Life is not just about you. It's about you being in the context of the community of faith. Give us this day. That's powerful. So you're a part of a group, a life group, hopefully. If not, we're going to talk to you about that next week. Get you signed up. But you're a part of a church. You're a part of a community. And we, that's what you have prayed. Give us this day our daily bread. So you, so you ask. And then your will, your kingdom come. So this is submitting to God, giving God the place of king, not just praying for temporal things, things of this earth, but praying for eternal things, things that will last forever, the kingdom of God, that our family would be centered on Jesus, that God would grow us spiritually, that God would build the church across the world. That's centering our, our heart on God. And then you say, show me, lead us. Lead us. Where do you want me to go today, God? Here's my appointments. Here's my schedule. But God, what do you want me to do? As I'm at the grocery store, as I'm, as I'm going into this meeting, I'm getting ready to go into this meeting. God, show me. Show me what you want me to do. Show me how you want me to talk. Show me how you, can, how you want to use me to encourage somebody. Show me how you want me to make a difference in this world for your glory. Show me your will. God, lead me. And all of a sudden, you pray that. You praise. You repent. You ask. You say, God, your will, your kingdom come. Show me. Do you see how powerful that is? A heart for God prays. I dare you to try this. I dare you to try this this week, every day. Take 10 minutes. Take 10 minutes and go through these things and see how God will align your heart to him and use you to change this world for his glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me at both locations? Let's just take a moment. We're going to pray for 2021 that we would be a church that prays, that we praise God, that we repent, that we ask, we say your will, and we say show me. Show me what you want us to do because, God, I want to live for you and your glory. And I want to see your kingdom come. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you for your grace, for your loving kindness, God, for the things that you want to do in our hearts, for the things that you want to do in our lives, Lord. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come in our hearts, Lord, that we would be people of prayer. We'd be people that are devoted, that we, are, we would be people that are consecrated every day. We're seeking you. We're honoring you. We're looking to you, and we're letting your will be done in our lives. God, let it, 
Let it happen in Jesus' name. Let it happen. Let us pray boldly. Let us pray consistently. Let us pray with passion and with trust. Let us pray confidently, Lord, knowing that you have a plan and you're working your plan. And Lord, let it all be based on a relationship with you as Father. We don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve to experience your goodness, but you give it so graciously. God, we love you. And we want to grow in our relationship with you. Teach us to pray. Teach us to know you. And draw us close. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship.